So welcome everyone to another episode of Podium Stories. Today we have a very special guest in the building. His name is Bob Rusterson. He's the co-founder and CEO of Landed Fintech, uh, the world's largest event series that provides context to the very rapidly changing universe of technology's impact on financial services. Uh, we've had a couple guests before on fintech, so for, for you guys that are listening, uh, they're interested in that topic, I think this is going to be very special. Uh, for over 20 years, uh, Bo has set himself apart as a leader in understanding, funding, and leading cutting-edge developments in fintech and financial services. Uh, Bo, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. My pleasure, Marty. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So I, I wanted to start with, um, and I think this is correct, but you worked at, at a, as a BC at Drastic Canyon Partners in Silicon Valley, uh, then landed was moved to Greater Denver area in Colorado. Uh, we, we're at a point in time where a lot of people are leaving Silicon Valley for COVID-19 circumstances. So I, I want to ask you a little bit about what are the differences in, in business culture that you find between the two places? Uh, and what should those people that are living in Silicon Valley to, to Colorado, which I've seen a few of them already, uh, expect from that, from that move? Great question and a, a timely question, as you mentioned. I left Silicon Valley in the mid-2000s, so a lot has changed. But uh, I, I would argue that a lot remains the same in terms of culture and uh, the availability of resources. I continue to believe that Silicon Valley will have a very special place in innovation for the very long future. And it is, uh, it will be a hotbed of innovation. That's, that I believe is um, self-evident. What didn't work for me was the, the one unintended consequence of, of being such an incredibly innovative space full of high tech, uh, bleeding edge companies is that there was there was rampant imposter syndrome and I felt it myself I felt like I'm not as hardworking as smart as diligent uh, as connected as as anyone around me and when are my competitors or my colleagues going to discover that I am a fraud right. and it just it's it seeped into my consciousness and and I realized it at the time, actually, and I thought, you know what, this is not healthy for me. I'm not performing at my best. And that's not why we moved back to Colorado. But when, when we did move back to my wife's hometown of Denver, uh, I rediscovered and fell in love with all over again Colorado and what it has to offer. And, um, you know, Denver and Colorado Springs and Fort Collins are, are sort of one, uh, they're, they're three separate cities but they form this line along the Rocky Mountains. And I'd say that each one has a different flavor. Uh, there's Boulder, of course, too. How could I forget Boulder? But, um, but there is a Midwestern culture. So for those of you that are uh, familiar with the United States, various different um, cultures and uh, uh, norms, Midwest meets pioneering and entrepreneurship and adventure in right. Colorado. So very friendly, very warm. Uh, culture in Denver uh, specifically, and then also that innovative uh, and adventuresome spirit. Um, and it's it's been an amazing home for us for the last 15 years. It, it's interesting that you mentioned imposter syndrome. I run, so I'm a dual citizen, Spanish and American, and I run, our business mostly runs in the United States. So I'm often in New York and it can definitely take a toll on your mental health. When, when you see, um, and for me, especially can be being an immigrant a little bit as well, I, I definitely felt that, that imposter syndrome that you're talking and, and it can really affect you from a personal standpoint that later translates into business. Yeah, for, and I, look, I'm a huge proponent of um, immigrants because you even mentioned the word, I'll just jump on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Look, uh, and Peter, my, my co-founder, who normally sits right there, uh, is also an immigrant from Australia. Um, and we almost every day we remind, remind each other, immigrants get the job done, right? right. Uh, and uh, America was built on that work ethic and that desire for self-improvement. And I think we'll touch on that a bit more. But, um, but you know, it, 
it's rampant in some of these larger cities. I didn't, I don't feel it as much in New York. It's probably there. Um, it's probably here in Colorado too, but uh, to a much lesser extent, does it impact me? Uh, I feel that, you know, just for me personally, Colorado has the right culture for me to be at my best. It, it's, and we'll move on into this, because this was just meant as, as the intro, but I think it's very interesting. Finding the right geographical environment around you can really change your performance as a business owner. Right? For me, I can tell that I perform differently when I'm in New York versus when I'm in Barcelona. When I'm in Barcelona, it's much more laid back. People are relaxing. They're, they're going um, for four-hour lunches versus when it's New York, I have to like get up to speed. So finding the right culture, I think it's, it's a big determinant of, of how we perform. Yeah, the four-minute lunch in New York. For me, eventually, while during a meeting as well. <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to ask you because with Landed, you guys are have different conferences and events around the world, and, and I'm imagining these last four, five, six months have been uh, challenging with COVID nineteen hitting you guys there. Uh, but but I've seen that you guys have already starting to adapt and adjust from that. So I, I want to ask how have the current circumstances affected uh, the business and what are the challenges that you're facing and how you're overcoming them? Yeah, the conference business has been annihilated right. uh, by, by COVID. And, and some of our colleagues in the, in the world of events have had good timing where they had their, their biggest event early in the year. So they, got, they, they gathered up a bunch of cash. For us, we were on the... Um, we were on the we're at the end of our cash as we're, as we're heading toward uh, May 13th and 14th of this year, yeah. where, you know, at first we're like, come hell or high water, we're having a live event. Um, and that turned out to be wrong. We, we couldn't, our, our business became illegal. Uh, and, uh, and at a terrible time. Now, thank goodness we did receive a PPP loan, which gave us a little more runway. We could hold on to, our employees for a while, and then, um, and and we were able to take other actions that allowed us to extend our cash and our runway. But in and this is direct quote from a letter to my investors uh, just a few weeks ago. Looking back on all the changes we made, if you think about a sawmill where you're making, you know, uh, furniture, wooden wooden items for the home. Um, we were literally sweeping the floors and, and packaging up the sawdust so we could sell it. We're right. doing everything we could to create cash to survive. In the end, and I guess we're not at the end yet, but right. in mid-course, we, we had to let go half of our team. The rest of us took a 50% wage cut. We, uh, we, we abandoned, for now, any sort of live event. Uh, and have done everything we can to create digital activities. Because the nice thing is, I mean, the, the saving grace is that Peter and I and the rest of our team care desperately for our community and for innovation and financial services. And our community respects that. And so when we launched something, like we launched a, uh, uh, a community called Lend It Fintech Digital that is a, um, it's a paid for community. You have, to, you have to pay us to get into this membership. It's not a huge amount, but it's something. And we, we're publishing now digital content weekly on that. Uh, we've got a jobs board. We've got a, a, an educational um, effort. Um, we have uh, paid webinars and on and on and on. And so because we could put our arms around a community and say, hey, look, we know you still have issues. Uh, we know you still have um, uh, pipelines to fill and customers that you need to talk to and learnings that you, especially now, you've got to learn, how are we going to deal with this moment? Um, our job actually became a lot more important. We just couldn't deliver it in a physical way. So, you know, we reinvented our, what it means to be led at FinTech in about a, you know, it's been three months. So I'll say we did it over a six week period and then we just executed like mad with a skeleton crew on, on partial wages. And, you know, I, we're gonna get through this. We know we're gonna get through it. And I think we're gonna be a lot stronger because of it. So, so when I would 
first came across your name and, and what Landit was doing before I asked you to, to be on the podcast, I had two thoughts on, on what was going on. One, if they get through it, they're, I think it seems like they're going to come out in a much better shape eventually in the long term um, than what they were before because they're going to have to adapt and adjust to what the new circumstances of the world are, which when live events comes back, it's another weapon in your, in your repertoire. But the second thought was, now from a mental standpoint, if I was a CEO, if I was you, I'd be struggling a lot. Like during those weeks where like the big source of cash goes away, um, it must have hit me really hard. And I was wondering how you dealt with it. Personally, I run a, a small company with five people and because of the services we provide, it, it helped us even uh, the pandemic and all this. But I know that there's the other side, which is what you guys had to go through. And I was wondering how you dealt with it mentally. Yeah, it's, it is, uh, it's probably, it's easily the biggest challenge I've ever faced as an entrepreneur. Right. But I had, I had 15 years of experience in the struggle, in the entrepreneurial struggle, where it was all just practice for this moment. And I felt a lot of, felt a lot of emotions, but I also felt like I was on a very even keel and, and everything came down to that mission of, you know, that realization that I just mentioned where our job is actually more important now than it ever has been. We need to get to work. How are we going to help our clients um, and our community? And from that, by creating that value, we were able to extract value. We were able to extract dollars from our clients that kept us alive. Uh, so in part, it was, it just came down to the mission. In part, it came down to 15 years of entrepreneurship, which was stacked on top of, you know, call it six or eight years of, of buy side experience, investment experience. And, uh, and then I'll say that, you know, there were some very pragmatic and tactical things that I did that helped. Um, I cleaned up my act in terms of what I was putting in my body. So no booze, no alcohol, uh, and only really healthy food. So I just, I, I went on a, what it was akin to a whole 30 diet, but not really like, yeah. you know, sort of breaking some of those rules, but really putting good food in my body. I started sleeping an hour more every night, at least. I increased my, my sleep, sort of target um, to seven, seven hours and 40 minutes a night when it used to be like six and change. Right. Um, I started exercising nearly every day. And then I started putting on, you know, adding these additional sort of tactical elements that were all about mental health um, and approaching it in different ways. Another thing was all screens off at 8.30 at night. No matter what, I had more work to do, but shut it down. Um, and normally it was earlier. I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I've done all I can for today. I'm going to go have dinner with the family and, uh, and I'm plug. And I've got a, I've got a, by American standards, an enormous family full of distractions, <laughs> like lots of fun and lots of chaos going on all the time. And, uh, and so that was always there. And, and I'll tell you what, the lack of travel was a huge bonus for me. Right. I've gotten more done because I've stopped traveling and, and all these other tactical things that I've been doing. Makes sense. Uh, it's been, it's been an incredibly creative and productive time. Yeah. It, it, I played college basketball when I was younger and, and the way you talk about it, it reminds me of like what a professional athlete has to, has to do when like playoffs come, right. And, and, and those important games come, there's, there's more to them just training more. There's a lot of things in the back end that, that it's not often seen, but it are equally as important to get us ready. Yeah, one of my good friends and um, mental conditioning coaches, a, a fellow named Trevor Moad, uh, wrote a book called It Takes What It Takes. And it was published this year around January, I think it was. And we had a conversation recently and it was just awesome to hear him talk about the choices that one has to make, if you're gonna play at the top of your game, you've gotta make different choices than the, than, than the rest of the world does, right? Um, um, and uh, reminds me of a 
quote that my son Jack talks about a lot, which is the world offers you comfort, but, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. Right. And, and if you're, if, if, if so, if I'm going to grab onto that and say, yes, I was made for greatness. I'm going to pursue that. I've got to make some different choices. Yeah. Uh, for the first 48 hours when uh, COVID started to hit and it seemed like we were going to go down, which we did. Uh, I, I remember I spent 48 hours in bed watching Netflix. And then on Monday I was like, look, I can either do this for four months or I can make a choice and just do what I know I have to do and right. take leadership for my team and, and take a step forward. But, but I remember the first 48 hours, I was like, oh no, like what, what's coming? There's that moment where, where it was a long moment for me where I was in denial and I was like, this is baloney. We're just gonna <laughs> blast right through this. <laughs> I was dead wrong, I was dead wrong. And then, bam. Uh, uh, going back to fintech, I I was reading an article from from an event you guys did in, in Tel Aviv, where you talk about embedded finance and you talk about big brands becoming financial services firms. So I was wondering if you could go a little bit more in depth into that concept, because um, it's something that previous guests have already mentioned, and I want to hear your thoughts as well on on how big brands are playing that transition out. Well, I. I put two, uh, two sort of de separate theses together to arrive at, at yeah. why embedded finance is going to be so important. And the first comes from my days back in Silicon Valley and then beyond where, um, you know, I really did feel when I was in Silicon Valley as a VC that technology was everything and that's where the profits were. And sure, software is eating the world and on and on, but there is a, there's a, there's a side to that that I didn't fully appreciate until I started building businesses, which was that technology commoditizes effort and allows us to scale effort and in so doing becomes a commodity itself. So if you create, if one creates a technology that is bleeding edge at one point, it, ex it extracts a lot of value in the beginning and then that value becomes a commodity or that technology becomes a commodity. So that's one thing. The other is that brands own communities. So Coca-Cola owns a community of people that are diehard Coca-Cola fans. Um, and then the spectrum of people that have it occasionally and, and have it all the time and then, yep. and then you know, swear against it and all that. But that is a, that is a brand that commands attention because of the quality of its product in a hundred years of service and, and on and on. The real power is in the brand that owns the community. The power is not in the technology. So when we think about FinTech, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in technology, in finance, that democratizes or commoditizes banking services, things that we only used to be able to get from banks. I want to buy a sofa. That sofa costs a thousand dollars. I don't have a thousand dollars cash. So I have to go to the bank or a credit card to get that thousand dollars. Not, that is not the fact anymore. One of the, one of the best things, best investments I made uh, uh, was a Christmas present to my family of a Peloton bike. Mm -hmm. I financed that through a firm. A firm is a FinTech partnered with Peloton. Peloton's the brand that's what drew me. I financed it through through a firm, a firm is making money, Peloton's making money, I'm satisfied. That is, um, that was not, we were not able to do that before that FinTech brand partnership happened. And that is exploding everywhere. So buy now, pay later. And, um, and that sort of embedded finance aspect of the brands becoming financially more capable and adding financing into the uh, into the suite of services they offer is uh, is is where we're going. Uh, l let me ask you a follow-up question on that. Do you think that threatens the personal finance of people who are not educated and allowing them to finance everything will jeopardize them in the future? That is a great question and one I really struggle with. I'm not sure is the, is the answer. I think that this is a great place for fintechs to uh, to step into, to really lean into. And I, and I believe that, so if we look at Money Lion and uh, Chime and Revolut and a lot of these other uh, challenger banks, 
they're taking a comprehensive view of finances. So if one were just, you know, going to the sofa mart and then going to the going to the kitchen supply store and then going to Home Depot and getting all these credit, you know, getting credit from all these places. Number one, you know, the lender, Home Depot is not doing this in a in a um, in in a, uh, a silo. Of, they're not doing it with blinders on. They're checking your credit. So right. they're going to help the, the the FICOs and the experience uh, the experience of the transunions of the world. They will put a put a damper on how much one can lend, but that's not sufficient. We need to be educated, and we need to also subscribe to services and be involved in challenger banks that are actually helping us make intelligent decisions. And I don't. I think that's going to be firmly implanted in our psyche after COVID. The, you know, the, the, the dip in consumerism that we've faced, I think will have very long-term effects. Uh, I don't believe we're going into a depression like we had in the 30s in America, but I think it may have a similar impact, irrespective of how long this lasts, on the American psyche. And I think we'll have a generation of savers uh, and we'll have some not anti-consumer behavior, but some some mollified consumer yeah. behavior, which honestly is going to be good for Americans because we're nuts when it comes to buying <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I was going to say consumerism and personal finance are probably not the strong arms of of the United States right so no, far. We, we'd love to import some some four hour lunches <laughs> and, and some reduced purchasing behavior. Uh, that would be great. Could you please help us that way? I'll, I'll bring it over next time I come. Uh, um, quick question: Would you describe Landed as a media company? Yes. Uh, so, what's the difference between running a media company like Landed or or regular business or companies such as NSR Invest and, and different companies that you've been involved uh, beforehand? It's the community is so much more important. That's first and foremost. And the community was important for the other companies that I founded, co-founded, or, or ran. And um, but an NSR Invest, great little company, super hard to build, right. uh, and 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 fraught with regulatory concerns. Right, just it's so hard to build a company that is formed to help retail investors when our government believes that retail investors shouldn't have the freedom to invest in these products. Right. So, I mean, nothing we did was, uh, was ever bordering on illegal. It's just that we had to jump through so many hoops to get, to, to create a security that offered a high yield and actually packaged it the way the SEC would say, oh yeah, um, Joe the barber can invest in this. Right. You know, and it, so it's just brutal, brutal business. Um, yeah, I think I think those those are the two big ones. Yeah, because uh, and we've seen a couple more questions before we wrap this up. So I want to I want to be respectful of your time. We've seen a lot of media companies eventually put out their own products and put out their own uh, even software that they've built. Do you, do you think that's somewhere that um, Lendis is going in the future, or or is that something that's not right now in the in consideration? No, I don't. I don't have any intention of of being a software company or productizing what um, or, or really. I mean, anything that we do for that might compete with a um, with our clients. I just don't see us doing. I really want to be there to bring the community together. What what we stand for is is first class content. So how can we come together? And expand our knowledge and our and our wisdom, if you will. Uh, uh, and the second is is bringing the community together to to network and to really get to know each other because business is done between people, and those people need to know and trust each other. Um, and those are two really, uh, you know, big pillars. Uh, and and everything we do is going to be some expression of that. Interesting. Uh, and la last question before we wrap this up. Uh, you've been involved in, in many different business and ventures over the years, many of them playing the role of the co-founder. Uh, so my business, I run it by myself. And I wanted to ask what's been your experience with working with other founders and how you manage the relationship? Even what are some of the things that you look for and even the red flags that, 
that you try to avoid when it comes to looking for a business partner? It is so important. It is, it is the, it is a huge decision and it is so much like a marriage right. because a company should not be built for a short term. It should not be transactional. It should be built for a very long life. And uh, so the selection of a, of a co-founder or, or even, even just, even if one is the founder and then the, the original sort of group that one gathers around oneself, uh, there are, I think, a couple of things that, that really come to mind. Now, with co-founder relationships specifically, because there's equity involved and there are, in the end, there are decisions that have to be made together. Um, two things stand out. One is, are we complementary, right? Do, do my weaknesses, uh, are, are they, are they complemented in such a way that your strengths can make up for my weaknesses? Right. That kind of, that's one, that's an obvious one. What's not so obvious is that co-founders may feel at a moment in time, that they are perfect for each other. And then they go on separate trajectories. So in the life of a company that is growing and morphing and changing, and, and especially, you know, through times like this, uh, there are different trajectories of growth and improvement among the people on the team. So if, uh, if I'm, you know, just on a, on, a, on a tear in terms of self-improvement and my co-founder is either disinterested in that or incapable of self-improvement, that is a bad match. No matter how well matched we are here, we're going up here together. And we've got to self-improve together. And of course, that's good. There's, it's not linear. But um, one of the things I would look for is a maniacal desire for self-improvement and investment in self. And I think that's just as improvement, just as important on the personal side as it is on the professional side. So finding a uh, finding a, a spouse, mm -hmm. right? If I am not interested in self-improvement, this. This is actually probably just as important. Find somebody else who's not interested in self-improvement and just, you know, go into a rut together and, <laughs> uh, and keep binging on Netflix through COVID. But if, but if we as, as mates are both keen to build ourselves into better versions of ourselves, great, because we're going we're gonna to help each other in that, in that struggle. And it is a struggle, both, you know, of course, in the personal and the, and the professional side. It's, it's a very strong analogy. Uh, I love that. I never even thought about like we might be a fit here, but are we going to be a fit in five years, ten years? Uh, but I, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, we're going to put links to, to your LinkedIn, to your to the company as well. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Thank you, Marty. That was awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the great questions and continued good luck and reach out to me anytime. I appreciate that. Thanks, Bo. Take care. Take care. Have a good day.